Welcome to those joining. We're going to start in about 30 seconds or so. Just let a few of the more participants um, uh, join the webinar. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative uh, webinar series. I'm Dan Polsky, I'm director of the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative. This is an initiative that brings together scholars from across the university who share a mission to advance health through an affordable, equitable, high value health system. At HBHI, we focus on the role of business and incentives in advancing this, this vision. So I'm delighted today to welcome you to the next installment of Conversations on the Business of Health. Um, still broken, mostly ignored, long-term care insurance in the United States. Um, a thank you to our co-sponsor, the Hopkins Economics of Alzheimer's and Services Center, or the head center. And now I'm gonna turn the proceedings over to our moderator and the organizer of this great session, Joanne Keenan. She's the Commonwealth Fund journalist in residence and assistant lecturer at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, Joanne, turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I have been covering healthcare in Washington for a couple of decades, actually, and um, I've covered pretty much everything there is to cover except a serious conversation about long-term care because I've never witnessed one. Um, <laughs> last act, which we'll mention at some point, you know, was a, a a bite at it, and it was repealed before it could take effect. So. I think what we really want to do today is talk about what the the intellectual framework for getting it on the agenda. What are fresh ideas and fresh ways of looking at this problem that will make it um, something that we can actually begin to grapple with? Because you know Congress is really expert at kicking cans. And this is a can that has been kicked into, you know, there's some kind of horrible metaphor here about, you know, kicking it into a demographic firestorm or something. Um, but, you know, it's just going to get worse, um, just given the demographics of this country. Um, clearly, we're not in an era where Congress is just jumping up and down, eager to spend more money. You know, the fight going on right now is about cutting. So um, assuming that we won't get a fix to this as part of the debt package deal, um, you know, we're going to start with Alice. And I mean, what, what I think I want to accomplish in this conversation is how to redefine the problem, how to look at it more broadly, which is something that Allison, who I will introduce them both in a second, Allison will, introduce, will, will, will help us think about it differently. And then Joanne is going to, the other Joanne is going to talk about a, a bill that she has been involved with that is really a different approach and has um, some internal bipartisan ideas. So our two guests are Allison Hoffman, who is a um, professor of law at Penn and the deputy dean there, and also is affiliated with the Leonard Davis Health Economics Institute there. And Joanne Lynn, who is, um, when I first met her a long time ago, she was a, still a practicing hospice doctor, um, <laughs> a geriatrician, a palliative care expert, and a researcher um, and advocate her um, on, on elder care and uh, long-term care and home and community-based solutions. We're going to start with Allison, um, and we won't be doing a lot of slides today. We'll, we'll, she'll start as she will put up some slides to just really not so much frame it, but help us think about how to reframe it, because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take um, people being able to come at this without the old baggage and without old assumptions and with some new ideas to possibly move forward because it's a devastating economic burden on families. Allison. Thank you, Joanne. And thank you all for inviting me to be here today. It's, it's really nice to have the chance to talk with you all about this really hard problem. And so I am gonna share slides for a minute and I'll do a little bit of framing, but I wanna leave lots of time for conversation as well. Okay, can you see those slides? Okay, great. Okay, so my work in this area has been to try to shift how we think about long-term care in a way that I think could make a solution, a policy solution more likely. I don't think it's gonna make it easy because I think this is an expensive problem and it will always be hard, um, but, but to try to just get people to think about it in, in a different way. 
So when we think about insurance, whether it's public insurance or private insurance, it's a policy tool that we use to spread risk among the population. So to make it really simple, we all pay in right to a pool. And then those of us who need the goods or services that are covered by the pool get to take back out again. The decision to include a benefit in that pool and in insurance is one that makes certain risks collectively managed. So we all share in them certain risks like loss of income, threats to our health, social harms. Um, so we all, you know, we, we all share those costs rather than leaving them to individuals to have to manage on their own. And when we think about long-term care, there are little pieces of it that are shared collectively in, in Medicaid and public insurance and a little bit in Medicare. Um, but private insurance hasn't worked. And so what it means is that people are really left to manage this problem on their own. And I think the way that what we've conceived of what insurance for long-term care could, and in fact should do, um, may be part of the problem. So what I wanna do is just suggest to kick off this conversation that we could reimagine the risk of long-term care to solve, to help to solve, to begin the conversations to solve this policy neglect of it. So when we think about long-term care, and we think about long-term care insurance, we think about it primarily as, as the risk of having a chronic illness or disability serious enough to require sustained care. And I call this what you see here on the left-hand side, care recipient risk. When somebody needs it, she needs care supports. If those supports are too expensive, it can cause her financial insecurity, or if she doesn't get them, if she gets the wrong or insufficient supports it can cause health insecurity. It is a risk faced by about 10 million people in this country at any one time. And contrary to what, how we think about this problem often, it's about half of those people are over age 65 and about half are under age 65. And so the question I ask is what if we look at the problem from the perspective of the friends and family who, as you all know, often become responsible for providing the needed care. Any one of us could, not all of us will, become responsible for intensive care for somebody, for a child with a serious disability or illness, an injured or ill spouse or partner, an ailing parent at some point in our lives. And so my question is, what if we thought about this as a risk? And I call it next friend risk. Next friend is a legal term of art. And it's, it's for somebody who, um, who stands up for somebody else in court and I like the term because of its neutrality. It doesn't imply that the next friend is a family member. It could be a friend. It doesn't imply that that person is the one who's going to provide the care. As you see here, that person could provide the care. They could arrange, they could pay for the care. Um, they're just simply the person who helps to make sure that that gap is filled. And so if you think about how we take care of long-term care now, Medicaid by default, has become the main payer for long-term care. This is just a quick snapshot to show you that Medicaid pays for over half of the paid supports out there. And when we think about how Medicaid has defined how we think about long-term care, it has, it has um, shaped our conception of, of what the government should do with regard to long-term care. And it has reinforced these obligations that friends and family will step in to provide long-term care informally by being an incomplete solution. It is not universal, it's means tested, which means that people have to spend down or deplete their assets to qualify. And even when they do qualify, it's still incomplete. And it, it is because fundamentally Medicaid doesn't prioritize paying for caregiving. And that goes all the way back to the creation of Medicaid and social insurance in this country in the mid 20th century, when we thought about risks as risks to household um, or family wages. And this vision of what that meant was that there was gonna be a wage earner out in the world and there was gonna be another person, the wife in the home who could do the caregiving. And so having to provide care wasn't something that created risks to household. And so we see as a result, things like those personal care services that are the core of long-term care, things like you know, helping somebody um, eat, helping somebody go to the bathroom, helping them transfer one, from one place to another, there were defined as optional Medicaid benefits. So states could, um, but don't have to cover these aspects of caregiving. Even more, Medicaid was based on a medicalized model of care, which meant that services had to be delivered in licensed institutions or by licensed professionals, which excluded a lot of the caregiving aspects of care, especially when they were happening at home. So we have this program designed in a way that by its very structure, prioritizes medical care over caregiving and relies on friends and family to step in for the latter, for the caregiving aspects of care. And that has even increased 
in recent years as, um, as policies have shifted. So Medicaid initially had what was called an institutional bias for long-term care, paid for care in nursing homes. And over the past few decades, that has changed. And so you see more care happening in, in what are called home and community-based services, mostly in home settings. Um, and with that, what you have, so let me show you what that looks like here. This is the shift, the, the line going down is dollars spent of Medicaid on institutional care. The line going up are dollars spent on home and community-based services. And as you see um, this change, this shift in funding, it's good in some ways, right? People with chronic illnesses and disability are getting, they can live at home. They could stay at home and get care that they need. But structurally, it's difficult to fund all of the care that somebody needs in home settings. And Medicaid has fell far from meeting the demand which results in more reliance on friends and family to provide that care, typically without pay, although not always without pay, um, if they can. And so my question is, what if we thought about these people who are stepping in, the, fr the friends and family, the next friends to provide care? Over 50 million people in this country provide some level of informal long-term care today, ranging from just a little bit, an hour to a week, to around the clock care. Most of those people care for a relative, about 89%, according to the AARP estimates, and a growing percentage of caregivers live with the recipient. Usually the care recipient is moved in with the caregivers. Although family have long provided care, right? This, is a, this may seem like a very normal concept to you. The idea of, of this care as a private obligation is becoming increasingly untenable as our world changes. So that idea of a breadwinner family structure, it never actually existed, but it is even more um, rare these days. There's nobody in the home dedicated to caregiving. The ratio of people to, who need care to those who can provide it is, is growing as medical technology advances, as the baby boomers are, uh, are beginning to age. We see families geographically dispersed, although that reversed a little bit during the pandemic, but kids are not always staying near their parents. If we think about the aging parents piece of the problem, and care needs are just becoming more complex over time. And so what does this mean? It means that it is really high cost for informal caregivers. It's hard to define exactly what that cost is. Descriptively, it's even hard to describe exactly what it is and it's hard to measure them. Although studies have tried to chip off pieces of that. So the one, one like kind of top number that the AARP gives through a report called Valuing Invaluable is if you estimated those unpaid caregiving hours, based on um, kind of the average caregiver wage, which is $16.59 an hour, it's about $600 billion of caregiving that is, is provided informally for free in 2021. Um, and so that's more than all the paid services. That slide that I showed off uh, to begin with, that's more than all, all the different sources that currently pay for care. And their estimate is conservative. You can look at it from other perspectives. So a, a widely relied on study, which is now a decade old, so this number would be even higher now, estimates that the average child who leaves work to care for a parent experiences about $300,000 in economic loss only. A study by my colleague, Norma Coe, that I really like, estimates that a daughter caring for her elderly mother for two years experiences a median cost of $180,000. So that's about the cost of a semi-private room in a nursing home. And her study uh, includes wages, lost leisure time, implications for future employability and wages, but it also builds in the intrinsic benefits for the care provider. So it uses, it, um, it uses those to, to decrease the estimate. Um, and, you know, and if you look at the effects on informal caregivers as well, about 40 to 70% of people caring for older adults have symptoms of depression. 25% meet the diagnostic criteria for major depression, which um, which outpaces the population. And part of what really concerns me and made me start to think about this problem too is that it, it absorbs somebody's time and money in a way that impedes somebody's life choices. As you know, if you have provided this care for somebody else or you've seen people do it, it sets their life in a different direction. It's really difficult to quantify that, but it's real, we've all seen it happen. And so what I ask is, what if we think about this as, what if we think about this responsibility as a risk? as a life cycle risk and something that is insurable. It's near universal, it's unpredictable. And when we consider it from the perspective of the next friend, it's uncontrollable in many cases. So even if people take on these roles with great love and generosity, which many people do, they face significant insecurity. And we haven't thought about that as an insurable risk in part because it's hidden, right? It's happening in people's houses. It's hidden from the public eye. 
and it's off the balance sheets. Uh, and so I argue we should think about these costs as an insurable social risk, as serious as the risk of disability when we think about it from the care recipient perspective. So if we thought about this, if we thought about the, the next friend um, risk as a possibly insurable risk, how does it make us think differently about it? Well, um, I'll just note a couple of these and then I'm happy to talk more about it in Q&A. The current estimates of long-term care costs hide the invisible co-payment of long-term care. It should actually say 600 billion there, right? So seeing these costs anchors the discussion in a different place. If you think about the dollars included in recent federal legislative drafts, even in the best case scenario, this is the, the 400 billion that was originally included in the Build Back Better bill, which then got reduced to 150 billion and then to zero in the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, this is nowhere near the need. So it helps us think about it. It's hard, makes it a harder problem, but a more realistic way of thinking about it. Uh, and Biden's recent executive order expresses an intention to work on long-term care but it's mostly through means of supporting caregivers rather than increasing funding for the problem. Reframing caregiving as a risk, and this is really, really, really motivated me to do this work, implies that it could be insured. Very few people can afford to self-insure, privately insure against the worst case scenarios. And so public insurance has to be part of the solution. And if we see this as a universal risk, if, if Congress people think about this as a risk that they may face and do face, it could build broader coalitions to want to address this problem. And so this all is kind of laying out why, this is my last slide and then I will stop, why we could uh, think about the responsibility for another's long-term care risk, uh, responsible for another's long-term care as a risk. So a couple thoughts on why I think we should. It could protect against a serious threat to the security of many American families. It is a threat that is dispro disproportionately experienced by women, uh, it's more common in African American, Hispanic, and low income families where you see um, where you see family members stepping in and providing care unpaid. So it's important for, um, for for egalitarian reasons. If we think about the underinvestment through policies, and in this problem, it has depleted both the physical and the human capital. We don't have good caregiving infrastructure, and so a funding infusion could begin to reverse that trend. And then finally, additional funding along with good policies could, I think, have long-term sociological impact. So if we think about long-term care policy that reshapes our conception of what responsibility for another means, the good daughter or the good son might not be synonymous with the person who takes mom into his or her home and provides that care for free, then it, 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 it starts to shape um, that, that that could be a good daughter or a son in other ways. It could be the person who helps her understand her insurance benefits and go out there and use those benefits to get the care that she needs. Um, so let me stop here. I, I, um, I know I'm kind of like, I'm at the 10,000 foot level and give, giving conceptually how, uh, how we could start to think about these problems differently. But I think that that's the first step to, um, to making serious progress forward in, in solving them. Yes, and people should um, put uh, questions in the Q&A and we'll, we'll work them into the conversation. But that's what we asked Allison to do is to set the stage at because it is a different way of defining the problem. It's a different perspective. It's a broader perspective. And, um, you know, I mean, when Medicare and Medicaid were created in 1965, um, long-term care wasn't really part of that equation, but we also live longer. We also live longer with chronic diseases and our whole healthcare, there's many, many, many ways in which our healthcare system is still an acute care system, even though we are now in a chronic disease society. Um, but I think that um, it, the idea of sort of looking at this larger impact, the economic impact, not just who's going to take care of granny, um, is something that it's not it's not partisan and it is I mean I think if you get lawmakers and their staffs to sort of look at that it is one way of sort of reopening a door to a conversation. Um, Joanne, I want you to talk about specifically um, the long term care insurance market never worked well and it doesn't really work at all now. I mean I don't think there's ever been a period where it was robust, but it 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 it's. It's completely broken. It's expensive. It's not there when people need it. It, you know, companies go broke. Um, it, it doesn't provide as much care as people think. People think they don't need it because they mistakenly think that Medicare pays for long-term care. All these things that, um, it, there's a long list of reasons it doesn't work. Um, 
the the two approaches traditionally in Congress have been, well, we'll fix the market and let the market work. Well, no one's ever actually figured out how to fix the market. And it's been years since they even had a hearing about approaching that. And then the other solution was, well, let government, let make it an entitlement and government will pick up the entire cost. That has not been politically tenable. It's an awful lot of money. Um, the the um, approach that, you know, you've been working on this thing called the wish bill, or at least it was, I'm not sure if you're still calling it the wish bill. Um, and it's a, it's a mixture. It's a, it's a, um, a, a it, it, it is, it has a private element and a public element. So why don't you describe that? And then we can take some questions and go into, and it also, does it even have a co-sponsor now? The co-sponsor, the main sponsor retired um, in, in and irresistible to point out that his district is now represented by Santos, but um, <laughs> which has nothing to do with the future of long-term care, but that's life. Um, so, so talk about the problem and then talk about, you know, its, its current status in Congress, if it even has a sponsor at the moment. Yeah, there are Congress persons willing to introduce it. It has not been reintroduced yet. Uh, and it still is at this point, the WISH Act. Uh, I should say that um, my comments will be pretty much about the 50% of people needing long-term care who are elderly. Um, the younger people draw from the same well, same services, um, you know, and at some point you really do have to work out the interface. I keep it separate in part because the preferences of people at 20 or 30 with serious disabilities are very different than the preferences of 80 and 90 year olds. And the care system somehow and the financing system somehow has to make sense of that eventually. But so my comments will be all about elder care, elder care. And the first thing to recognize is to kind of go back and underscore Allison's comments about the size of the problem. This is a huge financial issue. And you know when there were all the pictures in Life Magazine of all the little kids trundling off to elementary school in 1960, all of those people are getting old together. And it isn't when they turn 65, it's when they turn 80 that you know, serious uh, disability tends to become quite commonplace. And the lack of, um, of informal caregivers. You know, the average 80-year-old woman in 1900 would have more than 60 direct descendants who had no other person over 80 to take care of. And now the person who is disabled in old age, uh, if you count everybody in the society, has only seven people to turn to. I mean, the, the change in the family structure is, and, and in your chances of longevity are just so different than they were 100 years ago. And that woman they lived on a farm. They don't live nearby either, right? I mean, right. Well, not... and the woman lived on a farm. There was always room for one more. You could just add a, add a room. <laughs> um, there were people home all the time. Um, so it was just much more easy to fold that in to somebody in her direct family uh, chain, usually a her. Um, that's just no longer true. People are all separated. We've mixed and matched families. I mean, there's just a thousand reasons why this is just is not working as well. Nevertheless, more than half of the care in the country is given for, quote, free <laughs> by family members and friends. Um, and as Allison pointed out, that actually would end up costing more even at the minimum wage than the entire uh, formal care arrangements. Um, you're right that we have proposed a public-private mix, a very deliberately public-private mix, because the problem is so large. You can't expect that you're going to be able to solve it entirely outside of government being involved. And you can't just put it all on the government um, revenues. It just is way too huge. So let me um, share some of the uh, logic here and a little bit about the bill. Um, so let me go to. Um, so which stands for well-being insurance for seniors to be at home, right? That's yep, a, you got it. I wrote I can't, it. Down. I can't even rattle it off that well. <laughs> but I, I have a cheat sheet. <laughs> Okay, so why insurance? Allison's already pretty much addressed this. Uh, the risks are enormous and erratically imposed. So one of the first patients I picked up when I first started working in a nursing home had been there since before I was born. It was really quite something to rock me back on my heels that for the whole time I was growing up, getting trained, showing up as her doctor, she had been living in the nursing home. It is not plausible 
that a person could possibly have saved for that. She had a terrible stroke at age 42 and lived in a nursing home for the, you know, almost as long as she had been alive. Um, one in seven of us will need more than five years of long-term care at the HIPAA level, which is needing, dependent, needing help in two activities of daily living or requiring constant supervision due to cognitive failure. Uh, that's a pretty severe disability. That is not minor disability. That's not just a person who occasionally gets lost coming home or maybe needs some help of doing her taxes. This is um, quite substantial disability. So the risk is enormously different. And in old age, you can't make it up. It's not like it's a risk that you took on at 22 and then you have your lifetime to, to uh, correct it. You now have very limited opportunities to um, invest or save or earn money to, um, get, to come back. So basically it impoverishes families. It's now the biggest cause of impoverishment of families. Um, so we all need to be in on this. So it needs to be an insurance product. It needs to be a way in which we spread the risk. Why mandatory? It's because uh, you, A, don't want selection bias of people who expect to have long period of disability because both of their parents and three of their aunts and uncles all had serious um, uh, cognitive failure in old age. Um, but you also don't want people to simply imprudently not buy in. Um, the risk is widespread. And the costs end up falling on the community generally if a person is not protected. So just like we're making auto insurance mandatory, um, yeah, you pretty much have to have everybody in the pool. Why federal? This one has been a subject of a lot of contentious debate. Uh, states in, and, and a substantial number of states think they can do this on their own. But the Washington state experience is teaching us there are a lot of people who work across state boundaries. There are a lot of people who move around during their working life. And there are a lot of people who want to retire somewhere else. And when you add all those up, it is really hard to do a state-based um, insurance scheme that doesn't run into all of these problems. It is the case that there are people who go out of the country in old age and you would have to work that out, but that turns out to be a relatively modest problem and one that can readily be solved. But the, um, you know, the, the movement of Americans around the different states makes it really necessary that this be federal. This is also a point of great contention. Why not pay for the first dollar? Well, we have opted for the catastrophic approach because first dollar coverage can be handled by savings of one sort or another. Uh, the equity you have in your house, um, the equity you might have in a life insurance plan, the equity you have by having a bunch of children who are eager to help you or a whole lot of friends. Most people can get through a year, year and a half, two years um, without being utterly um, uh, impoverished. But it's the back end that is really devastating. So the person who gets seven or eight years, almost no one has saved enough for that. Um, so we made it catastrophic, but what counts as a catastrophe is different for different levels of income. So a person who has been in marginal jobs all of their life has barely been able to save much. A catastrophe is one year of needing long-term care in old age. But somebody who's made you know, a middle class income, their school teacher, their bus driver, something of the sort, probably more like two years. Um, and, you know, for the you know, Bill Gates of the world, we made it uh, topped, out, topped out at five years. So you can see as you go along in life, roughly what kind of risks you run for the front end coverage. And then the federal uh, insurance would kick in for the back end. Now, we did not make it cover everything. It we made it a cash benefit that would run at the current dollars at about $3,600 a month, which is about double what Social Security on average pays. So effectively, it's a targeted supplement to Social Security when you must live with serious disability. And we made it a cash benefit um, so that people could use it in whatever way made sense. They could repair the roof, they could pay their daughter, they could uh, pay for a home health aid, uh, through an agency, whatever it is that makes sense. 
but there are a lot of choices. Um, who, you know, which agency should administer this? Um, are you going to have just a flat rate across the country? Are you going to adjust for the cost of living in different places? A whole lot of small decisions that do have big effects. So the WISH Act did make all these decisions. We think we made them prudently, but these you could debate. The first four you can't really debate. The first four simply make it more appropriate uh, a way to arrange the society than what we have now. We are finally in a position where it is more expensive to let the situation drift than it would be to get it solved. So let me just tell you a little about the WISH Act. There you go, Joanne, the, the name. And it was introduced in the last Congress and it will be introduced in this one, but we're still trying to get some bipartisan coverage. We wrote it as a very um, Republican bill introduced by a Democrat. So this bill actually is structured like a private insurance scheme where every age group actually pays for itself. It is not current workers paying for current beneficiaries. You could, you could compromise that. You could make it partially more like Social Security, but uh, we made it extraordinarily responsible. So the federal government would collect 0.6% of wages, half from the employer, half from the employee. That's enough to fund the catastrophic long-term care. And then the private insurance market would be able to pick up and do lots of front-end coverage um, and for relatively small pools of people. So what is catastrophic? For those of you who want a little bit of the details, bottom 40% of the income uh, on average would get benefits after one year. Then it would go up um, with your um, average lifetime income. And the average person in the United States would wait one year and 10 months. The 70th percentile would wait three years. And as I said before, we capped it out at five years. You could vary that, obviously. This, this particular way of doing it is not core, but it works um, financially. So just as a demo of kind of what this would do, person who made 80,000 a year and needs 10 years of long-term care would start out having made their contributions. They'd be retired with no long-term care needed up till age 80. Their long-term care need would start and would be covered by their private insurance. And then they would kick into the WISH Act. But a person who made only 30,000 a year and needed four years of long-term care, same thing of contributing, same thing of being retired and no long-term care needed, but then when they kick into long-term care need, they'd be covered by Medicaid, and then WISH would kick in and uh, support Medicaid. So this project um, with the WISH Act actually saves an enormous amount of Medicaid. Um, it would reduce the elder care component of Medicaid by nearly half of what is expected to be increased. It would keep control in the hands of the, the elderly person and their family. It would continue that effort to have um, the government not having to know a whole lot about exactly what is happening to you and how you're spending your money. We included some protections against, um, you know, the grandchild absconding with the funds and things like that. Um, had an appeals process and all the attributes you need. Uh, but the big problem, just frankly, is that there are 43 people on this call right now. I'll bet that none of you will pick up the phone and call your congressman. None of you will pick up your phone and call your senator. The big problem is getting long-term care onto the public agenda at all. I mean, anything. Think about the last election, the midterms. Was there anything about long-term care? Well, you'd have to search real hard to find it. And if so, it would be a short-term solution, like increasing the uh, wages for nursing home aides, which will all vanish when we double the number of elderly people needing long-term care between 2015 and 2035. We are going to go back to warehousing people. We are going to have enormous numbers of elderly people homeless, we are going to have enormous numbers of elderly people unable to afford food and housing. So with a sweep of my pen, I can write for a $20,000 drug and I cannot get you supper. 
and I cannot get you a roof over your head. And the prediction before the pandemic was that half of the middle class would be unable to afford food, housing, and co-pays on medical care by 2029. That is now six years off, and we still haven't gotten long-term care onto the policy agenda. So that's the big problem. If we got it on the policy agenda and had the serious discussion, we would come up with better and better solutions. We would do some stupid things first, but we would eventually end up doing some good things. But instead, we are just letting it drift. And I cannot believe that this country is going to actually tolerate having huge numbers of elderly people living under bridges. So we are going to make available assisted suicide. We're going to make available that people simply don't get food and housing. Or we're going to have to do something useful very soon because it gets harder and harder to meet the need as the numbers grow. The, um, when we started planning this, um, discussing this event, we were saying, I mean, I think, you know, Dan and I were talking, no one's even talking about this. Like it's, it's so not on the radar as, as Joanne just pointed out, it's so not on the radar that there's not even a conversation. There's not hearings, there's not, I mean, the, the class act, which was a very partial solution was repealed. I mean, it, 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 there were sort of sort of historical accidents for why it never it, it, it never went through a final draft. It wasn't because the way the ACA was was finally passed and Senator Kenny's death, et cetera, et cetera. They never went through that last rewriting of a bill that could get through the House and the Senate. It got truncated and it didn't work. Um, the, the one thing that has happened since Dan and I had that conversation, but no one's even talking about this. How do we start a conversation? I mean, Biden did put one hundred and fifty billion. Uh, in his budget. Now, the budget is a wish list. The budget doesn't get enacted. Um, it shows some awareness. This is for Medicaid, expanded Medicaid spending on long term. It, it does. Sh it's not that the budget's going to get passed, but it does show that there are some people in the administration who at least are acknowledging and writing down, we want this money, even if they're not going to get it. And then there was also a sort of an interesting bill um, introduced just a couple of weeks ago. It's bipartisan. Um, it's Debbie Dingell, who is one of the few people in Washington who does talk about long-term care all the time. Um, you know, she was a caregiver for her late husband, said, uh, uh, Representative Dingell. Um, she has resources. She talks about the resources she has, and she talks about how damn hard it was, even with the resources she has, um, financial and status. He was, he was, you know, a congressman, and she's now a congressperson. Um, so she introduced a bill with Adrian Smith, who's a, a Republican on Ways and Means from Nebraska, who does a lot of rural health stuff. They don't have a whole lot in common politically, the two of them. He's pretty conservative. She's pretty liberal. Um, but they did put together a, a bill that would um, begin to address um, some, some of the long-term care needs, um, including it would be through Medicare under their plan, and it would actually um, do more home health um, for acute care as well as long-term care, and it would pay for some personal services, which is a not something that's usually uh, talked about as part of Medicare. So, no, I don't think this is about to become law. No, I don't think that they have the answer. No, I don't think that we can say, okay, problem solved. But I do think it's, you know, the difference between nobody talking about it, which was true a few months ago, and a few people talking about it <laughs> It's a, there's a distinction in Washington. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's injected in the mainstream, but I do think um, Debbie Dingell's pretty smart about getting attention. So I do think for those, um, I mean, I think, I think everybody's on this call because they care about it. I do think that um, it's a significant drop in a large bucket, but it's not insignificant. I mean, there is there is legislation, another approach uh, circulating. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how the long-term care insurance market is so broken. Uh, Joanne, I mean, as you, you've, only about 10% of people have it and it only covers about 5% of the cost. I mean, I may be off a few percentage points on that. That's the most recent numbers I could find. Um, mm -hmm. Families are paying the bulk of this. and. Yeah. And Medicaid is paying nursing homes and, and increasingly community-based solutions. But um, the, the idea that you have to go broke to get Medicaid is not good social policy, right? If this, in some ways, you can think about what the, the, 
the WISH Act, the, the, the program that Joanne just um, outlined, in some ways it's like reinsurance, right? It's, it's the, the private insurance market would have to get its act together, but they would be protected because when things got to a certain point, this federal catastrophic program would kick in. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, the, is, the long-term care insurance, care insurance market, market look like? long-term care insurance market started off with some very bad assumptions. They assumed that people would drop their long-term care insurance at the same rate they dropped their life insurance. And thereby they wrote an enormous number of policies in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s that were way too generous. Um, and every once in a while, I run into a patient who still has one of those policies that has no cap and, and um, is really quite generous. Um, all the policies you can buy now are capped effectively at around $250,000, either by saying they'll cover a certain number of years or they'll cover a certain amount of money per month or whatever. They, they cap it in various ways. Um, this is like being able to buy fire insurance for the skillet fire, but not for the house fire. Um, because what you're really scared about is the big loss, is you know seven or eight or 10 years of needing around the clock care. And you can't buy that. With you can't buy insurance. Can right. I mean, it's, with Alzheimer's can happen. I mean, with other, oh, it's yeah. not unheard yeah. of. It's, oh, no, it's not. A, and it's in fact increasing. Um, in how many people have long periods of, of HIPAA qualified long-term care. I mean, you know, the person who just has a bad hip and has a hard time walking or the person who's gone blind or deaf, those don't count. I mean, you have to get to the point where you can't get yourself to the toilet um, or you can't feed yourself or something like that. Can't dress yourself before you- Are there long-term carriers this. that even exist still to- yeah, There's the, still, there's still three- there are still three writing substantial numbers of policies, pretty much only for groups, um, pretty much only for as long as you're in that group. Um, but one of them is in substantial financial trouble and was almost sold to a Chinese firm last year, uh, ended up not going through, but they're still financially um, uh, you know, in precarious shape. Uh, the federal long-term care insurance is on a hiatus. It's been put on hold for at least a year, trying to figure out how to get it actuarially sound again. So right now, as a federal employee, you cannot buy into federal long-term care insurance. For many years, it was a really good deal. And then they realized that, again, they'd actuarially um, failed to update, and they um, they were faced with the risk that they would not have the funds to, um, to carry out the policies they'd already written. So that's still a story unfolding, but right now you cannot buy federal long-term care insurance. And when we say that 10% of people have it, we mean have something. Most of it is quite inadequate. Um, so, you know, um, basically we are uninsured for this enormous risk um, and most people are um, either blissfully unaware of that fact or are deliberately trying hard to turn their eyes to something else because our wages and our benefits do not incorporate the need to support people adequately in retirement, which has increasingly become a period that includes a couple of years of serious disability. Uh, remember, I mean, just, 40, 50 years ago, people who had their first heart attack did not make it to old age. People who had their first uh, round with lung cancer did not make it to Christmas. I mean, we now have so many illnesses that we have converted to chronic disease that we've made it very likely that people will spend their last couple of years seriously disabled. That doesn't mean it's bad time. For many of these people, it's very for many of what all of us hope to have. It's good time. It's time to get to know the grandkids or the great grandkids. And it's time to make your peace with God. And it's time to watch your garden grow or whatever matters to you. So I'm not saying this is grim, but it does mean that someone else needs to help you every day. And to have someone else help you every day is an expensive prospect. I'm going to go to some of the questions. Um, uh, one of the questions was, does, do other countries um, have better systems than we do for long-term care? And the short answer is yes. And maybe one of you will want to talk about one that you particularly like, but also for Allison, 
since many other countries, industrial countries do have a better, not perfect, but better than we do, um, are they looking at it the way you're recommending that we look at it? Are they looking at it from this holistic, you know, this is bad for the care, the, the patient, the family, the economy, the, the you know, absenteeism at work, um, lost income, people end up not having, people who are then dependent later because they left the workforce, they don't have social security, you know, it's, it's this, we've created this cycle of catastrophe. So um, is, is, is there a country that you're aware of that is thinking about, not just thinking about the financing smarter, but thinking of it in this sort of big picture, multifaceted way that, that you think of it, Allison? Yes. So, so I guess the first thing I would say is um, when we, if you look at U.S. healthcare spending, I always, I think this is a really interesting statistic, right? We spend more than twice other, the, the average OECD nation on healthcare. And then without better break, outcomes, <laughs> without better outcomes. And then if you break it down by category, we spend, you know, we spend like way more on inpatient care and outpatient care, and we spend less on long-term care. And so like, without even getting into the details, like it's like a lack of commitment to spending in this as compared to other areas of acute care needs, um, which you, you mentioned earlier, Joanne. I, I think other countries do think about it this way in ways that I agree with and don't agree with from a policy perspective. So for example, when, um, when Japan put a social insurance program into place for long-term care, there was a, a, um, a lobby internally that, uh, argued for it to only be able to be used on professional, the benefit could be used on professional caregivers, not family caregivers, in order to shift the reliance on family for long-term care. And so family could still provide it, they could do it for free. Um, but if you wanted to have the government pay for it, it was not going to be relying on, you know, the next generation for that care. Um, the German system is way more complicated and it has a number of things built in that actually create incentives for family members to provide the care with some compensation for doing so. It does that in part because um, because of a policy, you know, kind of a, a, a policy decision that that would be a social good, but also because of um, the need to address you know, shortages and professional caregivers to provide that care. So when you look at, it may not be explicit in the debate, sometimes it is as it was in Japan, but the actual uh, design of the policies is, is often positioning, how do we think about those informal caregivers and how do we build them into social insurance systems going forward? There's one thing that every other country that I know of does that we do not do. That is that long-term care has a home in the structure of government and usually with the healthcare system, the medical care system. So, it is a natural part of the debate because someone is responsible. So you know, th there is a debate in Germany and there is a debate in Japan and there is a debate in Denmark and, and the Netherlands about how you're going to do long-term care. And we don't have that because no one is responsible. I mean, the family ends up being responsible in some ways if you have a family. Half of women over 85 have no one who could be a volunteer caregiver. So the fact that policy is made mainly by men who cleverly married women two years younger, who provide the volunteer care in old age, then are on their own with barely half of their income, um, kind of escapes everybody's awareness. It's just a problem of old women. And you know, in other countries, they actually measure the quality of care. I mean, there, there is a, a registry in uh, Sweden, for example, of every elderly person, and you know where you have a lot of pressure ulcers. You know where you have people who have trouble getting food. <laughs> we, don't, we don't, not only don't have that, we have no idea. We actually have a study done by Brown University called More Than a Meal that recruited six cities in the US with more than a six month waiting list to deliver food to the elderly and randomized people to get Meals on Wheels, get food delivered by UPS or get nothing. And much to your surprise, people do better with food than without. Aren't you glad to know that? But isn't it terrible that we could run that study that there was easy to find half a dozen cities in the US where a person who had no way to get food in 
had to wait more than six months. And where's that on the public policy stage? The Americans with Disabilities, uh, I'm not saying the, um, uh, the Older Americans Act is up for renewal this year. The advocacy groups are all delighted if they're talking about a 10% increase. Damn it, the Older Americans Act needs a doubling. Medicare has quadrupled in the time that the Older Americans Act has stagnated. That's why I can write for a $20,000 drug and I can't get you supper. This is crazy. You need supper more than my drugs. And we have a question also about Medicare Advantage because about half the population, the elderly population is, is in Medicare Advantage now. Um, and so are they beginning to do, um, they have more flexibility in certain ways and they do some things that people are crazy about and some people that people are not so happy about. Um, you know, how much could that be a venue, for, a, a pathway for more uh, coverage of care at home or care, um, long, what we call long-term care? And the related question is, are there, um, within the special need plans, are there models that we should be looking at? Um, and can they fit into the kinds of solutions that, you know, what, how do they fit into if we were to come with the, the big picture solution, how, how would they integrate? Yeah, Medicare Advantage plans, in my experience, have mostly learned to dodge these patients. So mostly they make their money by using the risk adjustment that Medicare uses to pay them, which does not take account of social situation does not take account of whether you have a caregiver and any of those sorts of things. Um, there are plans that are trying out various things, uh, usually in small ways. Um, you know, when all those advertisements come up in October and November about all the wonderful things Medicare Advantage will do for you, they're mostly limited to two or three weeks at best. Um, they are not really long-term care. Uh, the best plan is a very unique special needs plan, that's PACE, the Program of All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly, that um, is effectively available only to dual eligibles, but uh, by all measures so far is doing a remarkably good job. Um, had only about half the mortality rate that um, uh, the rate, uh, the elderly people generally had in COVID. Um, has very low rate of things like pressure ulcers and caregiver burnout and all those things, but it's effectively available only to people who are also already on Medicaid because of a screw up in how they interpreted the Part D element that's really about the drug cost. Uh, it should be fixed and then PACE could grow enormously. That's what I want when I need it. But the other special needs plans are quite variable. Some are doing a fairly good job and, and you know, the one here in Massachusetts is good. Quickly define a special needs plan in case anyone on doesn't know. Uh, well, there are three. There are three varieties. Um, there's those that are living in a, an institution on ISNIP. There's dual SNPs that are only for Medicaid only, and there's chronic care SNPs. And each of them has an underbelly of abuse uh, in which you know very little is being done, and they're getting extra payment. Um, but each of them has some examples that are doing very very well and are um, really providing excellent care. Uh, the one here in Massachusetts is a DSNP and it's um, doing a, I think a, very, a job rather similar to PACE where they're really working on um, you know, in-home uh, services and making sure housing's available and, and social services and, and supporting the family caregiver and all those things. Um, but you know, not all of them are like that. And more and more of them are investor owned um, and investor owned does not necessarily mean that it's a problem, but it means that someone's expecting to take 10 or 12% off the top. And if you're taking care of very sick people, taking 10 or 12% off the top is really tough. So, you know, the, um, like everything else in the capitation world, it's, it's a, um, it is a spotty endeavor. <laughs> and you can find excellence and you can find a whole lot of stuff that um, uh, is not serving the public well. <laughs> what do you think, Allison? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I was going to, where you ended, I was is something I've been watching carefully. I think that I think is really interesting when private equity starts to move into a space as, as Dan Polsky has looked at, I, I, you know, I'm like, why are they moving into this space and what are they hoping to get out of it? But I, I and I've, I've just been surprised with the investment we've seen um, in Medicare Advantage plans for the sickest of populations. And so I, I you know, I don't think we know yet what's going to come out of that space. And I, and I, I think it's a really interesting and important question to ask. But when you lift back out of it, it's not creating the funding that's necessary, right? They're building on existing funding sources and they're trying to use them in, um, you know, in the best world, in the best case scenario in more efficient ways. And so then you can have more money to pay for the care that somebody needs or the social supports or whatever it may be. Um, but it doesn't solve the larger, the meta problems of the fact that when somebody's not a dual eligible, what is Medicare going to pay for? What are they not? What is that private Medicare Advantage plan, even if it tries to supplement, um, going to be able to do or not? Um, there's somebody who's uh, questioning the assertion that uh, long-term care insurance policies are 250, 250,000 or less. So I just want to note that, uh, I don't um, I mean, Joanne, you're pretty expert on this. And I don't know, Allison, if you're yeah, familiar. I mean there are plans that can go up higher. You mostly can't qualify by the time you're 45 or 50 because you've got some hypertension or something and you get it underwritten. But even if you can qualify, they're terribly expensive and you can get seven-year plans or 10-year plans. But most of the ones that are sold now have something like a $7,000 a month limitation and a three-year limitation. Well, if you multiply that all out, you come up to pretty close to 250000 And it might be a $5,000 limitation in four years or, you know, one way or another. Or it might only be a $100,000 policy total. I mean, the one that got sold in Washington State was, you know, 36500 total. So there's a lot of variety. And whoever it was who raised the question, yes, it is possible to get bigger plans. It is not likely. And it is not likely that you can qualify or that you can find somebody willing to sell it to you. And most of the ones now being sold, especially in group situations, have serious limitations at about at something about like this, you know, 200 to 300,000 or two to four years or something like that. Um, so, you know, if you really think you have data otherwise, please send it to me. I'm Dr. Joanne Lynn at gmail.com. But certainly that's all that I've found. I'm sure Allison would be interested to see that too, if you actually have data that, that an ordinary person at 55 could buy a policy that would be unlimited or 10 years or a million dollars at any price that's, that's conceivably affordable to a person who has had a middle income in the US. So we're gonna end, we only have like two minutes. So there's a good question I wanna end with for both of you, that this person points out that long term term care makes me think it's something I can just keep not thinking about now. It's long term. It's off in the future. I don't have to. And maybe Congress is that way, too. Um, have, have we thought about a different name for it? Would that um, if we're talking about reinvigorating conversation, should I mean, this is we're talking about a conversation in Washington. It's all about branding. I mean, is there is there a way that we can actually call it something else? And should we? And just quick, a quick thought. It's not something that you have published on, and then we are will be out of time. I think it's such a good question. I, you know, this is part of what I'm trying to do by reframing it as next friend risk, because that's the thing that people are experiencing when they're, you know, when they're in the 40 to 60 year old years, right? And they're caring for children, and they're caring for parents, and they're caring for aging partners. And uh, I think it, I think if we need to think about the problem as something that that can't be uh, in the distance and in the future. And and behavioral economists have done a lot of work that show that when pe when risks are something that is you know many years away people undervalue those risks or kind of underestimate those risks so that's part of what motivates me is it is indeed a marketing campaign to say how do we think about this as a risk that any of us today might face yeah, i mean i was struck with um, one person's uh, framing as a, a young people i mean young adults are faced a triple mortgage they have uh, school debt, they have their own, they want to buy a house and start a family, and they have their parents or grandparents debt that is trickling down through the family and hitting them. And so the people most invested in this are actually people 20 to 35. Um, you know, the boomers kind of wrote our script, you know, we, we wrote the script, we're going to endure it. And so it so it goes. But to the extent that we pass along um, a continually reducing uh, legacy um, 
uh, it, within the family, um, that's a real problem for ensuing generations. I, I would love for there to be some serious marketing research on this issue. Of course, that requires that it be a public issue, which is, of course, the big problem is to get anybody to talk about it at all. <laughs> and, I mean, even the advocates for long-term care, and I've talked with hundreds, say, you know, you're right. We ought to do this. We ought to have passed it in 1980. It's the right solution. But first I need to and fill in the blank. I need to fix the payment for uh, home health aids or I need to improve infection control or whatever. I mean, there, there are 20 good things to do about serious disability and old age. And I'm behind all of them. And they're all going to fail within a dozen years if we don't have better financing. Because at some point, you just have to put people onto the street if they can't pay their rent. And are you really going to put large numbers of 90 year olds in their wheelchairs under the bridge? And I think the country will rebel against that, but I sure hope we don't have to get there in order to have the rebellion because at that point it will be terribly expensive and we'll learn to simply put people in barracks. We'll learn to not do good services and good care. And, and people will choose to be dead rather than to endure it. Um, you know, we're making suicide so available. So let's get cracking. And there's still 32 people on. Please call your senator, call your congressman. It doesn't matter what you ask for. Just ask what they're going to do about long-term care and old age. And they won't have an answer. But by the 20th person who calls, they will have an answer. They so will have an answer. We are out of we are out of time now. Um, I think this is a conversation we should sort of come back to in some ways next year, including maybe looking at what's in our next year's seminars. Maybe maybe look at what's gone on in Washington State because they are the one state that tried to do it, and it is not it is not uh, it's not a panacea. But anyway, thank you both for attending. Um, uh, thank the audience, and uh, we will. I guess we have one or two more events this year, and then we start all over again in September. So uh, join us. Thanks. Thank you.